As rare and intimate photographs emerge for auction, we delve into the untold story of Edward Baoya's passionate relationship that predates Wallace Simpson. This affair, lasting a remarkable 15 years, was with a woman whom he affectionately called Mummy, and with whom he shared profound emotional and physical connections, even going to the extent of pleading for physical discipline to bring him to his senses. These captivating photographic portraits of Edward Vi capture him in his youth when he was the 25-year-old Prince of Wales back in 1919. It is believed that these portraits were intended as a gift for his then-married lover, Frida Dudley Ward, whose enduring affair with Edward only ended when she decided not to leave her husband. Edward would eventually marry Wallace Simpson, another married woman, and in doing so, abdicate the throne. However, his long-standing relationship with Frida was, in many ways, the most passionate and enlightening of all, as detailed in Rachel Truthy's biography. In a poignant letter penned by Edward, it becomes evident that he felt trapped and overwhelmed by his royal responsibilities. He yearned to escape it all with the woman he loved, even fantasizing about giving up his position as heir to the throne for a new life. In his words, he expressed the desire to be free to live or die according to how hard I worked, with the condition that he could have Frida all to himself, which he believed would bring him true happiness and contentment. This heartfelt letter, however, was written 17 years before the famous abdication crisis of 1936, and the recipient of his affections was not Wallace, but the enigmatic Frida Dudley Ward. For a decade and a half, Frida Dudley Ward held a unique and powerful place in Edward's life, characterized by an intense and all-consuming passion, comparable to what he later felt for Wallace. Frida's influence extended beyond the physical. She was not just his lover but also his confidant, wielding an almost dominatrix-like authority over him. Edward's unwavering devotion to Freda was evident in his letters, where he often referred to her as his precious darling little mummy, and even begged for punishment. This fervor was undoubtedly fueled by the knowledge that Frida had not only a husband but also another lover, making her hold over Edward all the more compelling. Had Frida agreed to marry Edward, it is conceivable that she would have been the catalyst for a constitutional crisis, and the world might never have heard of Mrs. Wallace Simpson. The fateful meeting between Frida and Edward occurred during a Zeppelin raid in March 1918, when Frida sought refuge in the doorway of a grand house in Belgrave Square, London. Inside, a party was in full swing, with the Prince of Wales among the guests, and his encounter with Frida proved to be captivating. Frida, at 24, was petite, attractive, and exuded both sex appeal and warmth. She projected an image of needing protection while harboring inner strength, a combination that drew Edward to her. Frida's unique quality was her ability to elevate and empower the men in her life, particularly those with insecurities, like Edward. Despite the significant difference in their social status, Frida was not an aristocrat but the daughter of a Nottingham lace manufacturer. Edward was drawn to her. Complicating matters further, Frida was not free when she and Edward began their dalliance. She had married William Dudley Ward, a promising liberal MP, shortly before her 19th birthday in 1913, and they had two daughters together. However, by the time she crossed paths with the prince, her marriage was strained. Her husband's appointment as vice chamberlain to the royal household in 1917 took him away from home frequently, leaving Freda bored and seeking solace in a growing connection with the most eligible bachelor in the world. The passionate couple found ways to be together, often spending their days in each other's company. They were physically well-matched, both possessing fashionable, slender physiques. When not in London, Frida would stay at Kilby's Farm near Windsor, owned by one of her husband's sisters, providing them with a discreet retreat to nurture their forbidden love. The photograph we have before us today offers a fascinating glimpse into the complex love life of Edward, the Prince of Wales. In this captivating snapshot from 1932, we witness Edward, the future King Edward by I, in the company of not one, but two of his mistresses, both accompanying him on a trip to the theater. The intricacies of his romantic affairs, concealed from the prying eyes of the public, were nonetheless widely known among London's high society. On the left stands Frida Dudley Ward, 
a glamorous and sexually dominant woman who held a significant place in Edward's heart. Despite her marital status and her concurrent involvement with banker Michael Herbert, she was a central figure in the prince's life. To the right, we see another of Edward's lovers, Thelma Furness, an American who, at the time, was married to Marmaduke, Viscount Furness. It was Thelma who later introduced Edward to Wallace Simpson, a name that would become synonymous with the abdication crisis. Edward's passion for his married mistress, Frida Dudley Ward, knew no bounds. When separated, he would call her four or five times a night, expressing his longing. His devotion extended to a torrent of letters addressed to his beloved, My Angel, each signed with affectionate endearments like tons and tons of love from your E. He would even gaze at her photograph, kept in a small leather frame by his bedside or in his pocket, and tenderly kiss it. He confided in her that thoughts of her made him feel fearfully naughty. Frida played the role of the mature and dominant partner in their relationship, a trait that greatly attracted Edward. Indeed, Edward had a penchant for strong-willed women, a preference that predated his encounter with Wallace Simpson. In a letter to Frida, he once expressed a desire for her to be really foul to him at times, to curse and be cruel, believing it would do him good and bring him to his senses. In another letter, he implored her to come to London and give me that hiding while suggesting that he needed her to chase him into bed with a big stick. Edward's fixation on sex dates back to 1916 when his equerries introduced him to a French prostitute named Paulette during a visit to Amiens. Shortly thereafter, he initiated an affair with the Parisian courtesan Marguerite Alibert, known as Maggie, who had a reputation as a dominatrix. Maggie would later make headlines in 1923 when she shot her Egyptian playboy husband, Ali Fami, at the Savoy. In his relationship with Frida, it became evident that Edward sought not only sexual gratification, but also a maternal figure. He vented his frustrations about the stifling formality of court life, his distaste for official duties, and even his doubts about his desire to be king. While immensely popular, the pressure of meeting people with high expectations took its toll on him. Freda candidly reminded him of his destiny, reassuring him that he could never escape his fate as a future king. Edward wrote to Freda, expressing that his greatest desire was to be with you always, and he feared that his heart would break if she ever stopped loving him. He promised to whisk her away to any corner of the world if she decided to be with him, professing his love for her above all else. However, the prospect of marriage or elopement was implausible for Frida, given her existing marriage, which would necessitate a divorce, an option unacceptable to both his parents and the church. Nevertheless, the couple reveled in a lively social life, dancing the nights away in Mayfair and Chelsea. The prince was known for his impeccable dancing skills, and gossip columnists often commented on how perfectly he partnered with Frida. Their social escapades extended to nightclubs like Ciro's, Quaglino's, and the Kit Kat, but their favorite haunt was the Embassy, located in the basement of Old Bond Street. They even embraced the Charleston dance craze, taking lessons at the Café de Paris when it arrived in London from the U.S. Frida, however, held an interest in politics and preferred the company of intellectuals over the cocktail set. Friends described her as one of the brightest women they had ever known, and she would often visit slums and report her experiences to the prince. In the intricate web of Edward's romantic entanglements, Frida Dudley Ward stood as a significant and influential figure, her role extending beyond mere passion into the realms of politics and companionship. In the midst of all this, it appeared that Frida's husband had come to terms with his wife's relationship with the heir to the throne. It seemed likely that Duddy, as he was affectionately called, wished to avoid the inevitable scandal that would accompany a divorce. Additionally, he likely considered the detrimental impact it would have on his own career and the well-being of his daughters. Over time, it became increasingly evident that Frida and Duddy were leading separate lives. Frida introduced her daughters to the prince, and he genuinely adored them. Pempe and Angie spent so much time with their mother's lover that they began to treat him as an honorary uncle, affectionately referring to him as the little prince. When Frida was away, he would sit with the girls, cutting out pictures with them until their bedtime. 
A significant portion of London's high society was aware of the relationship between Frida and Edward, including the government. However, they managed to keep the affair a well-guarded secret from the general public. When Edward's parents finally learned the truth, they were horrified. They viewed Frida as a scandalous figure, often referring to her as a scarlet woman. King George V even went so far as to dismissively label her as the lace maker's daughter. As time passed, Frida became increasingly distressed by the gossip surrounding their relationship and suffered bouts of depression. She made several attempts to end the affair, but Edward resorted to emotional manipulation to keep her by his side. In one poignant letter, Edward wrote words that would fascinate Freudians. From now onwards, I'll try to teach myself to look at you only as Freddy Mummy, though it's going to be the hardest task of my life, but I swear I will try, though a chap can love his mummy. He addressed her as his little slave, or parpy, puppy, displaying a slavish devotion that made it difficult for their love to be completely reciprocated. Another obstacle to their relationship was Frida's involvement in an equally intense affair with Michael Herbert, a banker and cousin of the Earl of Pembroke. Michael was dark-haired, handsome, and charismatic. He wasn't just an eligible bachelor, he was also a delightful companion with an infectious smile. Meanwhile, Prince Edward had his own share of extramarital affairs, often involving women in Frida's social circle. There were even rumors of a fling with Frida's youngest sister, Vera. In 1926, Edward met and began seeing Thelma Furness, a twice-married American woman, in addition to maintaining his relationship with Frida. Thelma was kind and beautiful, but she could only provide physical comfort to the prince, not the emotional support he needed. She recognized that Edward was a complex individual, but she never truly understood him. However, she didn't need to, as Freda continued to play the role of his confidant, even during Edward's visits to Thelma most afternoons. Finally, in June 1930, Freda divorced Deddy on grounds of his adultery. However, this came too late for Michael, who tragically passed away in September 1932 at the age of 39. Frida was devastated, and her family believes that he, rather than the Prince of Wales, was the true love of her life. Now, for the first time, it seemed that the prince could be the sole man in Frida's life. Yet, as with Michael, her newfound freedom had come too late. Her relationship with Edward, though intense, had already passed its zenith. It's worth noting that Thelma Furness played a pivotal role in introducing her fellow American Wallace Simpson to Edward. Their first meeting took place at Thelma's country home, Borough Court, on January 10, 1931. Thelma encouraged Edward's friendship with Wallace, who was then married to Ernest Simpson, an Anglo-American shipping broker. Thelma hoped that introducing him to witty guests outside his usual circles would keep him entertained. However, Wallace's sharp wit and repartee captured the prince's interest more than Thelma had intended. By 1934, when Edward returned from a trip to America and reunited with Wallace at her Regent's Park house, he was polite but distant. During a weekend at Fort Belvedere, Edward's home in Windsor Great Park, Thelma noticed that Edward and Wallace had developed a connection with private jokes. After observing her friend and lover together, Thelma realized that she had been replaced. She left Fort Belvedere the next morning, never to return. The end of Edward's 16-year relationship with Frida was equally harsh and abrupt. After not hearing from him for several weeks, Frida called Street James's palace, only to be told by the operator, I have orders not to put you through. This marked the end of communication between Frida and the prince, and she was deeply hurt by his neglect. Edward had made up his mind that he wanted to be with Wallace, and this time he was determined to make a lasting commitment, regardless of the cost. Dear friend, if you like everything new about the royal family and don't want to miss all the novelties, subscribe to our channel and like it. By doing so, you take part in our development. We work for you.